Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 22nd, I believe, yes, of June on the Gregorian calendar, which happens to be the 11th of the fourth month on our Creator's calendar. It's the second Sabbath of summer for us as we reckon it. And we are continuing with our reading of Bereshit or Genesis. And we're currently during the times where our forefathers were beginning to make their way into Egypt or Mitzrayim. Yahusuf had already been there as a forerunner, suffered through the things that were appointed to him, and has come forth to be at the right hand of Pharaoh. And now during the times of the famine, his brothers are having to come in because all the land is suffering. They're having to seek from Pharaoh or from Egypt, the grain that is there. Now, there's a lot to think about. I highly encourage everyone to, to do these things. We can never cover everything in one reading that you could go over. But the idea that Abraham had to transverse the land and to migrate to different places for food during a famine was a prede predecessor of these events. It was foreshadowing this very thing happening as a pre-covenant sojourning before they are given the land type and shadow. That's exactly what he walked out. Went into Egypt, was persecuted, his wife was taken, Pharaoh was plagued, and then he came out with great booty. That's what happened with Abraham or Abram, and then later on with the children in a larger scale as we'll get to. But like I said, we can't always cover every nuance and detail. So I encourage you to think about the things that we point out as we read here. And one of them is, why would Abraham be helped out? Would Yitzhak be able to stay in the land during a famine, but yet the children need to leave? Why did they have to go into Mitzrayim and then their children go into bondage? It's because of reaping that which you're sowing and the inequity of the fathers being put into the children's children to the third and fourth, just as Yahuwah, our Mashiach, coming in, in the burning bush, will later announce to Moshe, right? But here we go. This is Bereshit chapter 43, and the return to Mitzrayim, or Egypt, with Benjamin. A little recap. They'd already been one time... They'd had Shimon or Simon, one of their brothers, kept in captivity while the others were allowed to go back with the grain. And their silver was found in the bags, which scared them all. But now, without recourse, they're out of food and they're having to return. They could not return without their brother here or else um, he would take them for the spies that he accused them of being. And the entire thing, as we've already read a little bit, but we'll see in more detail in other writings, the entire thing was contrived by Yahusuf to see whether or not their hearts are, are still the way they were when they mistreated him, or if they're reformed. So, now it says, and the famine, right? Kavad, this is heavy. This is the kavod or kabed right here. They say ka bed, but they say severe. This is the same word where we get for esteem. They translate it as glory in many places, but it literally means to be heavy or weighty, right? <clears throat> it says, now the famine was heavy in the land, and it came to be. It says when, but it says like which is literally, cough is as or like or resembling, and asher is that or which. So it's like that or like which is when. That's how the English does that. It seems a little confusing, but when you look at how these things are written, and then the context of the, the words, the English word is what makes sense there. That's why they do that. If you want to be literal, it would be like which, but people don't say that. So, you know, it's not a common phrase in English anymore. And it came to be when or like which 
this is they had finished but it's literally they all or him all unto eating eth the grain which they had brought right from mitzrayim and he said elohim or sorry and he said elohim to them their father go back shuv is to return teshuva they say is repent right that it means to return to turn back shuv okay it says go back and buy unto us a little right me'et little fewness a few right a little food now right here this is aleph Kof Lamed. It looks like A K L, but when you have the dot up here, it makes that an O. And one of the phenomenon they say with like the ayin or the aleph in modern Hebrew, they don't have their own sound. They make the corresponding sound of the vowel that's placed by them. How it worked in the original way Hebrews written is something we can go over some other time. There's things that are known by scholars. The original vowel system, the mater lectonis, for example, is written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's known about, but this is what replaced it. So for right or wrong, it's the, it's the facts of what is. We have to try to deal with reality. And I'm just trying to point out what is. I don't agree with changing, adding, or doing any of that stuff because he told us not to. And there is evidence that they've used the vowel points to hide things. One of the most plain and egregious examples is in Psalm, what was it, 23? Or 20, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to mess that up. But where it says, at a line at my hands and feet. When in reality, the Hebrew should have been, and he pierced my hands and my feet. But they use vowel points to change that. So I can't agree with those kind of things. But the fact that these exist and they were used for a purpose to approximate the sound is true. So I'm just trying to point those out. People can talk about, and there's always room for discussion about all of these things. I'm not... I'm not dogmatic or particular about anything there because, to be honest with you, I think it's more important to comprehend what he's trying to say than to be able to pronounce the biblical Hebrew or scriptural Hebrew 100% correctly. He told us there's going to be a time when we all have one lip, and I long for it. But we, even in America, I don't know how you can say it is for anywhere else in any other country, but the amounts of dialects of English that you can get are divergent from one coast to another, from one city to another, let alone from coast to coast. I have difficulty comprehending how some of people even speak English sometimes. I'll be perfectly honest. But um, that will be restored. Until then, we have to learn compassion. We have to be patient, right? So anyways, a little food. It says... And he said, or and he spoke to him, Yahuda, unto saying, solemnly, this says ha'ed, ha -ed, right? Literally, od, ed, ud, right here, is to return, go about, repeat, do again, literally to again and again and again, emphatically go over. It says solemnly here. But you can see here, it's to repeat, to do again and again, to restore or relive, revive, right? That means to go over it again. And also, Ed, like you are my witnesses, is I in Dalit. You can look at that when you go about checking different words here. Ood. To return, go about, repeat, or do again. To bear witness. All right? And this is what he says here. <clears throat> he said unto them, witnessing, he, he 
witnessing the witness. Right? It says he solemnly warned unto us the man saying, never return or never, sorry, you'll see him, my face, unless, right? Your brother, Aki Kem, is with you. All right, it says, if Yishka, right? If yes, Ka, if yes, you, if in substance, right? If in substance you send Eth, our brother, with us, we will go down and buy unto us, or unto you, rather, food. But if... Right, so this is if, whether, or on the condition. But if Ein, if not you, will send him, never, Narad, will go down. For the man said unto us, never you will see my face unless your brother is with you. And he said, Yishrael, or Yisrael, depending on how you want to pronounce that, the... The sheen right here, just so you know, if you get the, oh, what is it? There's two books that are vocabularies that are recommended by Bill Barrick in his 503 Hebrew Grammar. One's the student vocabulary, and I think that's a great resource. It's the student vocabulary of biblical Hebrew and Aramaic. It has a chart right in the front with the vowels, with all the pronunciations of phonetics, and then you go through a list of the most commonly used words in what they call the Bible. Of the letter sheen, there's two pronunciations, seen and sheen, they call it. It's a sin to say sin, is the thing they use to say seen instead of shin, sin, but it's S-I-N or S-H-I-N. And it depends on where the dot is over on one side or the other. On this side, it's just the S without the H sound, and on the other, it's the SH. That's the only distinguishing mark here. Now, of those, you have about 127 words. I may be mistaken. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, re I remember that number specifically in the, the scriptures, where the sheen makes an S sound without the H accompanying it. I believe that phenomenon is due to Ephraim's not being able to say the S-H but in the language. So the words that they were prominent in speaking, it dropped the H sound. That's why they were persecuted in saying Sibboleth instead of Shibboleth when Ephraim and Manasseh were fighting amongst one another in the times of Judges that we will get to. So whether this is Yisrael or Yishrael in reality, I can't tell you. I'm not going to say one is preferred over the other. Some some people even say Yasharal, like the upright Yashar of El. And I can't tell you that one was wrong either. I wasn't there when he originally gave it. So that's one of the things I was mentioning about. We can't be dogmatic living so far down the road with the, the English language that we have, we should just be eternally grateful that is, it is so easy to see how many words from English come directly from the Hebrew. That fact alone is, is amazing to me. But back on point. It says, And he said, Yisrael, or Yisrael, unto them, or sorry, Lahem, Lama, unto why? Right? What, how, anything. Ma. Salama is why. Why did you deal ill unto me to tell the man that you had yet to you a brother? But they said, ask specifically the man unto us and our family. All right. That's Moladotu or Moladotnu. Remember that Lamed Dalit Ladat or lada, or yalad, sorry, yod lamed dalit is that word to beget. It's also the word for a child, or the, the what the offspring, if you will, in Hebrew. 
And in English is where we get the word for a lad. It's an archaic way of saying a boy. Here, with the mem wa in front of it and the tau, that's our family. Or literally family. And then the noon, the noon wa is the r. So you, you can see how these words are related and how they grow from one another. The mem is the place of or the means through which you have children, which would be the family. And the noon is ours. So pretty simple. And literally all of Hebrew functions this way. It, the essence of it, what it means is built into the language itself. This is, and the man specifically asked unto us and our family, saying, still your father alive, Chai, right? And it says, have you a brother? And we told him, according to the mouth, the words these, right? It says, could possibly, it says, it says, how could we have known, how could we possibly have known that he would say to bring down your brother? That's what they're asking. It just doesn't come across when you read the Hebrew straight. It says, And he said, Yahuda, to Yisrael, his father, send the boy with me, and we will arise, right, that comb, and we will stand and go, that we may live. Right? and never die, and not die, namoth. Both, gam, right, we, anachnu, and you with us, or you also, and our little ones. Now remember the last time we'd read, it was Reuben who mentioned, oh, let us go down and if I don't bring him back, let him go with me. And if I don't bring him back, you can kill my two sons. And that was not satisfactory to uh, his father in any capacity to release his son to him. But here you say, you see that Yahuda says, my life for his, not another substitute, but his own. He's standing to give. And that was what was a foreshadowing of the kinsman redeemer. The reason why the kingdom was given, the, the propensity of that was genetically in his children, just like repenting is in Abraham and his seed forever, right? That kind of disposition was given by his choice here. And the reward for it is obviously all his children are ruling the world today. Because that capacity is in them. This is in both we and our children and our little ones, sorry. It says... Anoki, he says, I will guarantee. He says, to take on pledge, to give in pledge or exchange. Arab. This word is very similar to uh, some other ones. It's not pronounced the same, but if you look over here, to be sweet or pleasing, it's also the word to become evening or dark, where we get the word Arab for mixed right to mix and it's also that darkness step dwellers it was also the darkness um that is used sorry during the exodus it's one of the excuse me one of the plagues that we will get to uh, i'll have to show you later it won't show you right there but we'll see when we get to the plagues that it is actually Arab. It's a mixture or a darkening over the eyes. They talk about, they also have this as the raven of the wadi in the Proverbs, for example. But here we go. And he says, I will guarantee, right? From my hand, you shall require. If not, I will bring him back to you and set him before you, literally before your face or before your presence. Then let bear the blame, it says, but that's literally, and my sin is what that says, to miss, go wrong, or sin. But he says, it's my sin 
unto me all the time. Right? Basically, it's going to be his sin for to bear for all time if he does not bring him back. Right? For if not, we had lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. And said to them, Yisrael, their father, or father of them, right? If so, or I'm Ken, right? So if thus, then this do. Literally, then this him do, right? If truly, right? If Ken, then do it. Take some of the best of the fruits of the land, all right? in your vessels and carry down right that radad unto the man a present a little balm and a little honey that debash right debas they say vas devas right there um they also will use this it's literally honey from a bees uh from bees here in a honey cone and then in modern they use this very word for syrup it's a date honey that they have it. It's the name of it they use. But he says, and take some of the best fruits and a little bit of honey, sorry, and spices and myrrh. And it says pistachios. Yeah. Bitten is a bitunim pistachio. Okay. Now, this connection it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but when you when we look more into it, you'll see the Greek language in particular would take the bet and make it into a p. Britain was they had a b for Britain. They had a p b for the um, Parthians on occasion, and there were other words where they'd have a p or a b intermixed. We've even seen a few of the examples in the um, the book we shared that had over 2,000 entries with, uh, what was that? I'll have to find the book again, but it was, it was one of the lost, talking about the lost tribes and where they went. N no, it, it is date palm trees. They do have milk and honey, but it's also literal honey from honeybees too. It wasn't literal milk that they had coming out, but they had lots of cattle that would produce milk as well. So whether it was date or honey, it, the, the truth in every context, I can't say how this was used or how that was used beforehand definitively without going over it though. Anytime, you're most welcome. Um, there are some contentions people have an issue with using honey because it comes from a bee and they say bees are unclean we have the example of the honey eaten from bees in the the time of judges in shemuel with uh shaul and his son yahoo nathan what happened with him after his father had made a vow and they ate honey and then we also have the mentions in the Proverbs and other places. If you look at just the Masoretic text, it's slightly ambiguous about where that honey could come from. When you look at the Septuagint version of what is mentioned in the Proverbs, it gives you great details about the honey bee and what it does and how it's a, a picture of wisdom. Yes, that is also true. Yahu Kanan, the immerser, was eating locusts and wild honey. For anyone that might not be aware, here's another example, for example, of nescience versus ignorance, where you have the one in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says that Dawid did not know that you were not, a king was not supposed to accumulate multiple wives unto himself. And because the book of the law or the book of the covenant was hidden in the ark until the, the coming of Zadok. So he could not have known that and it was not held against him, although he did have problems in his life because of it just the same. Another example is in our modern day, 
the idea of eating locusts is still done by some people. And you can find, you know, people talking about it. They'll eat them raw, just toss them right in their mouth and chew. Some people would cook, some people would eat otherwise. And if you just go by what insincerity is in scripture, there's nothing impermissible with that. And during this time when it could not have been known, it would have never been held against anyone who chose to eat a locust raw because it was not in his word not to. Now that the Dead Sea Scrolls are available for anyone to read, you can actually find the instructions that say specifically because of the nature of them, the fact that they are a, a living creature, they have to be boiled or they have to be baked, they have to be fried because such is their nature that they require cooking. So now that that is available, it is now ignorance and not nescience for people to continue to do those things that they would have otherwise done with a clear conscience. Father willing, that makes more sense to people in simple terms because that's literally what we're all kind of going through. Before his truth was returning, we couldn't know these things like his name until he, until the woe was ended, this, this um, second woe specifically, going by what's in Gad the seer, um, his refuge being lost was his name being taken from creation. And until that was restored, which was also promised that he has given his name to men and he will do it. It was, you know, until that happened, it wasn't held against any sincere believer who called on a name that wasn't true because it could not have been known otherwise. But now that the truth is able to be known, we're held accountable for that or we will be this is the thing that we have to keep in mind and that's why when we take and when we hear about these things how we respond the behaviors that we manifest are having to deal with the ruach or the spirits that are in us whether unto life or not whether you investigate these things in sincerity to see if they're so like those more noble ones of the Brians or if you don't, right? But anyways, he said unto them, Yisrael, their father, if so, then this do, right? Take some of the best of the fruits. I already read that part. I'm sorry. We, we read to the myrrh, pistachios, and almonds, right? That shek, shekidim. Shekid is an almond. Okay, and then probably also for the almond tree, yes. And then you see shakid right here to be shaped like an almond. And it's also shakid, very same spelling, but different pronunciation means to watch or be wakeful. And the reason why I wanted to show you that really quick is because in... Uh, what is it? Yeah, right here, Yirmiyahu, chapter one, he gives you a parable, or he gives him a vision. He says, what do you see, Yirmiyahu? And he says, I see some almonds or an almond tree or whatever. And then he says, and for truly, for I am watching over my word to do it. And he uses the play on words there between the almond and to watch in the very text right there for everyone to read as an example for these things. You can find these all throughout scripture and the words that are used have significance in foretelling the, the things that actually happen too. We've covered it before. We can go over it more in detail in the course of time, but the Lollards being mentioned by name, the round heads, all right, the woman in the wilderness, the Buddhists to be exiled and bad. All of these are literally words that are used in foretelling these events, and the people in history adopt names with those words incorporated, literally. So uh, this is where these significances are shown to us, where we can look at them and start to learn. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So it says, 
and almonds and silver, kasaf, double, right? Take double the silver in your hand. At the silver that was returned in the mouth of your sacks, take back in your hand. Perhaps it says an oversight, but it says a mistake, right? Perhaps a mistake it was. And he's saying, bring it back and perhaps they'll see that it was a mistake, that you're not going to be at fault for robbing them because you're not just paying them for what you're getting this time, but you're going to pay for what you had already had, right? Well, uh, this is, and your brother take also and stand or and arise, go back to the man and El Shaddai he give unto them mercy, rechamim. This isn't, um, rechamim is compassion. Racham is tender compassions, right? Not mercy in itself. They usually have the different word chesed for mercy, which is also like loving kindness. But it says, and El Shaddai give unto them mercy compassion before the face of the man that he may release unto them eth their brother their other brother right and eth benyamin says wa'ani and i kasher says like which which he translates as if if i am bereaved i am bereaved but he says like if like which or like that I'm bereaved, I am bereaved. So be it. He's basically saying. And he took, or it's literally, and he took him, but they say, so took the men, F, the gifts, hazot, this, literally the this, but they just put this, right? It's pointing out this gift which is the definite article there. I don't know why they always do that, but you'll notice whenever they have a definite article, they follow through with all the things that are applying to it in the sentence. And it's an easy way for you to see what parts of the sentence all go together because they'll all have, like, for example, they all have the definite article here. The only exception would be the Aleph Tau. Literal Hebrew is the min, f, the gif, the this, but it says the min's f took this gift, right? The double silver. And they took in their hand and Benyamin, and they arose, or and he arose him and went down, or and he went down to Mitzrayim. And they stood before the face of Yahusuf, or before the presence of Yahusuf. Literally to take one stand. Or it says, and when he saw Yahusuf with them at Benyamin, right? Then he said to the steward, over his house, Habo, it says, take these men to my home. Literally have these men come, the coming at these men to my home. And slaughter, tabach, right? An animal and make ready for with me, he will dine him, these men, right? The men. And then this is at noon or in noon. They say zahar, zohar is midday or literally the hot part, right? The heat of the day as they call it. And so he did the man as which he had said, Yahusuf. And they said order, but it's Amar, the same word as to say, right? And he brought the man at the men into the house of Yahusuf and were afraid the men, key for because they were brought into the house of Yahusuf. And they said, because or upon the matter of the silver which was returned in our sacks the first time we are brought in that he may assault 
sorry, it's to roll or roll away. Gimel, Lamed, Lamed, Galal, right? It's like Galil, similar word, but you'd put a, a Yod there to roll away, right? Gilgal is another one to roll away the reproach of his people, as we'll see later on. <clears throat> but it says that he, that he may roll away, it says that he may assault, but he may roll against us or to us that fall. Literally like Nephilim, right? Te Nephel, unto the falling. So they're saying that all of this is happening for their demise because of the stuff that they had done to their brother. They're acknowledging the things that they're suffering is because of what had already happened. This is what we would call, or this is what the world would call karma for lack of better term, because they don't know it's the righteous judge who does these things, right? Kesem, we've talked about it before, but Kesem, Kuf, Q, Samic, Mem is the Hebrew word for fate or the uh, karma where you get like kismet in the Indian I idea of that. That's where that word comes from in the Hebrew. But that's in the Proverbs where it says your fate or the fate is on the lips of the sovereign and right ruling his mouth trespasses not. Same picture or the same word there. But um, it says that, that he may roll against us and fall upon us to take ethnu, us as slaves or as servants. And it says, and with our donkeys, us with our donkeys, right? Now, this might seem like an odd phrase, although it's because they came with donkeys and they're, they're going to have be enslaved with them but it's significant to us because of what it represents, right? As first covenant believers in parable form, it's kind of a picture. Their obstinance in doing the will of our maker is already given to their forefathers is why we're, they're going through this to begin with. This is, and they drew near to the steward or to the man, literally the steward, over the house of Yahusuf, and they discussed, they talked with him, or to him at the door, or literally to him at the opening, right, of the house, which would be the door. And he said to him, in you, sir, I don't know what be, it's a in you, or please I pray, sorry, in me, that that it literally means in me, but it's a it's a plea. It means please, I pray, I beg you, excuse me. There you go. They don't have it translated for some reason, but he says, please, sir, or please, my master. Yerad, come down. It says indeed because it's repeated, but it's like coming down. We came the first time to buy grain or to for food. And it came to be, when we came to the encampment, the lodging place or inn, okay, when we came to the lodging place that we opened at our sacks, and this was after they had left the area, wahini, right, and behold, silver, the silver of each man in the mouth of his sack, our silver in full weight. So we have brought back eth him, literally it, in our hands. And the silver other we have brought in our hands to buy food. Not we do know who put our silver into our in our sacks. It says, so we don't know who put our silver in our sacks, but we've brought it in addition to the stuff that we've bought or brought to buy more. It says, but he said, or and he said, shalom. They say peace, right? Shalom lekum. In many Middle Eastern areas and in Islam in general, they have these sayings, shalom alekum or shalom alekam. 
and then you'd reverse it alakam shalom this is where you'd see the one of the first references to that shalom lekum peace unto you and then the common way to res respond to that would be alakam shalom or lekum shalom to you and unto you peace right but he said shalom lekum unto you al this al with a path act, so it's Al, like Al Bundy, right? That means not. Same word is like Elohim, El, which is mighty one, or Al, which is to or toward. Al means not. It's different. It, the one who can say no is the one who has the power to make it go to, and the one who is mighty. These are all the things are all together. It generally is the same essence of the word, but how it's used differs based on context. That That's how all of these function. That's how the Hebrew language itself functions, and you can really see that in detail if you ever listen to the uh, Eryptology videos, where he goes over that quite a bit. But um, you can see it in the course of doing this yourself, too, if you just look up the words and you think about it. But it says, and do not be afraid. That word yara is to see as well as to fear. He saw, and to see him is to be afraid of him, right? When you really see the future judgment, as Clement says, then you will truly fear the Almighty and turn away from evil. It says, and do not be afraid. Elohim, Elohim, right? Your Elohim and the Elohim of your fathers has given unto you treasure in your sacks. Your silver had I, and he brought to them Eth Shimon. So he basically, you know, don't worry about it. You, that was a gift from your creator, and here's your brother. So he came, or so he brought the man Eth the men into the house of Yahusuf, and he gave them water, and he washed their feet, the regalahem, right? But, and he washed the feet, and he gave them feed under their donkeys. And they made ready at the gift for arrival or for the coming of Yahusuf at noon, or at the hot part of the day, literally. For they heard that there, remember I said the Shem is the word for there, that there he would eat lechem, bread. And when came Yahusuf, right, to the house or his home, then they brought unto him at the gift, which was in the hand, unto the house or in the house, and bow down another fulfillment of the vision or the dreams that he had seen if you recall this is and he bowed down before him to the ground and he asked unto them if they were well or unto shalom right and they said ha shalom well is remember when you can have the hey there, whenever it's a half vowel, whatever follows is a question. Whenever it's not a half vowel, it's the definite article. It's pointing out the. But otherwise, this is heshalom abichem, right? So this is, is, is peaceful, right? Your father, the old man of whom you spoke, is he, right? Is he alive? Or is he literally the witness of him living, right? And they answered him, Shalom, he's in good health unto your servant, is our father, and he is still alive. And they bowed down their heads and prostrated themselves. And we, we looked at the word again, but to bow down, right? So they bowed down their heads and then they prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw Eth Benyamin, his brother, the son of his mother. And he said, 
This is your brother, the younger of whom you spoke to me. And he said, Elohim, be favorable, or literally, he give you favor. He give hen to you, or grace as they call it, right? My son, Beni. So made haste, Yahusuf, for he yearned in his heart for his brother, and he sought to weep, and he went into his chamber and wept. Wayabok, right? There, Sema. And he washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself to hold or be strong. A fuck, right? So he reserved himself from being emotional. And he said, serve the bread. So they set a place unto him by himself and them by themselves and the Mitzrayim eating with him by themselves. There's that word for bad, right? I kept telling you that it means to be exiled or, or alone, a separation. It says, because no, they could, no, they could eat the Egyptian, or no, they could, the Egyptians, unto eating eth with the Hebrews. Food for an abomination that unto the Egyptians. If you're not familiar, the Egyptians abominated um, eating anything that the Hebrews did. They thought that they were sacred and not to be eaten, if I remember correctly. But it was other animals that were abomination to the Hebrews that were offered and sacrificed and eaten accordingly in Egypt, literally a contradiction to the truth given, just for context. Suzanne, they sat before him, the firstborn, Bikor, right? Bikor is the firstborn, Bikarim is first fruits. So in the birth, uh, sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and looked in astonishment, the men, man towards another or a man towards his friend or neighbor and he took portions from before him to them but was as much the portion of benjamin as any of theirs five times so he's saying it was five times more than the rest of theirs so they drank and were merry with him All right, so not according to expectation at all, but they came, they thought that there was going to be more problems, and then things are topsy-turvy, everything's not as bad as they wanted, and all of a sudden, boom, they're being treated, and not only treated, but treated very well, and their brother greatly benefited. So, I'm willing that's... Um, Something we can all take time to think on, too, because all of these things are significant. All right, so continuing with chapter 44 here, it says, And he commanded Wayazu that Zaudi Wahe is usually to lay charge upon, give command or order. These are the commands of Yahuwah to man, are usually the zoo there, as opposed to his judgments, which are the mitzvot. Okay, there's different words for these, and Torah is instructions. We'll go over those in the course of time, too. This says, and he commanded Eth the steward, upon, or the steward over the house, unto them, Malai, right? Fill Eth the sacks of the men with food, as much as they can carry, and put, right, and set or place the silver of the man in the mouth of, right, his sack. That word right here, the pay, is literally a mouth. And the bet means in. So in the mouth of is literally how that word can be. And then right here, amatakcha, amtakath, right here, amtakath is the word for a sack. 
I've never seen that from originally metath is to yeah, metach is to spread out. Okay. So the thing that is spread out would be a sack or the thing that you, then you wrap it up. All right. I suppose that makes sense. And see, that's literally how you have to look at these words. When you don't know it, you look at the source, you look at where it comes from, and then how it's spelled. And when you really want to get into them, you can use the Strong's Concordance is okay. Just don't get dogmatic about the numbers. They have multiple numbers for the same letters, and you want to look at how the words are used everywhere. Or you can use Ernest Klein's Etymological Dictionary for the Hebrew language for readers of English which it will have the spellings of all right together. So you get the sense of the meaning back to back and you can read it all in one spot. That's the best way to learn. And you can go do individual letters, break down the groups and see how it's spelled. And then variants when you have a yod in the middle of it, when you have a hey at the end or a mem at the beginning, and then see how it's translated and how the word is actually used. And then when you do that, you get a sense of what it actually is. It's not easy, but nothing nothing that's worthwhile is. If you really want to know these things, it's just what has to be done. And as you take the time to do it, then it becomes more familiar and it's simple. It becomes easier as you grow, right? It says, well, eth, they say and, they don't translate the Aleph Tau there. It says, well, eth, my cup, the cup of the silver put or place in the mouth of the sack of the youngest. Wa'eth, the silver of for his grain, or and the silver for his grain. And he did, according to the word, that's kid bar, they say. Remember I, that abra kadabra, that's kadabar. They say, according to the word of Yahusuf, that he had spoken. As soon, or, and it says, Habbokar, it says, the dawn light, it says, as soon as morning dawn is how they translate that, but this is Habbokar or, it's like the dawning of light, and then the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. Him, and when they'd gone eth from the city, not far off, right? So when they'd only gone a little bit, then Yahusuf and Yahusuf said unto his steward of or over the house, Stand or arise, Radoff, this is follow or pursue. This is like pursuing like a bandit would pursue a to chase or persecute, but it's like you would, what bandits would pursue a stagecoach, you know, trying to chase it down to go rob it. That's the kind of idea with Radaf there, or Radaf. And that's how we're supposed to pursue righteousness. It's mentioned in the, in the, the Psalms and other places. This is pursue after them or the men. And when you overtake them, then say unto them, Why have you repaid evil for tov, or pleasantness? Is not this which drinks my master from, and he indeed practices divination, to practice divination or observe signs, meaning it's the cup that he divines from, as it's translated in some places, right? So, and is this not the cup that he divines with? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, or, or so he came upon them, and he spoke, or he, and he's yeah, and he spoke unto them at the words of the matters as these, right? And he said to them, or to him, why does say my master the words that these far be it from us? So he says. And they said unto him, Why do your master say these words? Far be it from your servants that we should do such a thing. Behold, the silver which we had found in the mouth of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. Then how could we steal 
from the house of your master, silver or gold. With whomever, so which yamatse, like matzah, right? He says, which is found at who or with him of your servants and die. So let him die. And also, Anaknu, we will be unto my master, unto servants or slaves. And he said also now, or he said also at this time, according to your words, right? And he's basically, let it be at this time, according to your words, or as you say or speak. Ken, or thusly, this is it, right? So it was, or so it is that was found, or so it came, or so it, sorry, they say so it who, but that doesn't make sense. It's so let it be who it is found with, right? But literally, Ken, who, Asher, Yamatsa, surely thus he which it is found with, right? With him, he shall be unto me a slave, and you shall be blameless. Right here, that word is clean or kept from exempt. You shall be blameless or clean. And speedily they lowered each man, or, and speedily they lowered him, the man, at his sack to the ground, and opened man his sack. Right? They say each his sack. It says, so he searched with the oldest or the greatest, big adult, he began. And with the youngest, he left off and was found the cup in the sack of Benjamin. And they tore their clothes and loaded. This is a different word for clothing than usually what I read in the Hebrew and it says, and they tore their garments. It's usually the word baguette, but this one is different. And it's literally a wrapper or mantle, not necessarily their clothes, but the mantle that they wore. Okay. This is, and they tore their mantles and loaded the man upon, or man upon his donkey and returned to the city. And, and he came, Yahuda and his brothers into the house of Yahusuf, and he was still there, and they fell before his face to the ground. And he said unto them, Yahusuf, What deed, or what have you done this that you have done? Did not you know that surely I practice divination, or sure, that I surely divine, right, as they translate in other places, a man which as I am, right? Or a man such as I. And he said, Yahuda, what shall what shall we say unto my master? What shall we speak? Or what can we say? Or or how shall we clear ourselves? That word right here is to be just or righteous, Zadok. Right? Or how do we this say clear ourselves, but that's not uh, that's not Zadok right there. That has a tau. So that's two different words, unless that's a typo. We'll have to look into it more. <clears throat> but it says, and how will we declare ourselves righteous? The Elohim has found out eth our inequity, or the inequity of your servants. Behold, we are slaves unto my master, both we and also which was found, or, and also he which was found in the cup with him. So saying both our brother and I, we are all slaves with him. But he said, far be it. What is that? Kalila, right? Almost like Lila for night with a chait in front of it to be, which is an enclosure. This is far be it. Excuse me. Far be it from me or unto me that I should do this, 
the man who it was found the cup in his hand, he shall be unto me a slave or a servant. And as for you, or and unto them, go up, literally, literally upon him, unto Shalom, to your father. So they're saying, go up to your father in Shalom, but the one in whose hand it was found, he shall be a slave. And came near to him, Yahuda, and said, please, excuse me, right, that be, I, I beg you, my master, let, let me speak. Now your servant a word in your ears, my master, and not do let burn, yechar, literally to burn or be kindled with anger, and not be angry or not burn your anger against your servant. For you are even like Pharaoh, me kamu, right? Or ki kamuk, Pharaoh. It says, my master asked eth his servant, saying, have you a father or a brother? And we said to my master, or Adoni, yish, Substance, yes, unto us a father, an elder, zekin, that's the word for literally beard, right? It means old here, but it's to become old, right? And it's also the word for, oh, i got to go the other way, sorry. Beard or chin, it's the word that is also used for an elder, when it's the elders of the congregation, it's the be the bearded ones, literally. But it says he is bearded or an old man and a child of his old age is young or who is young and his brother is dead and is left he alone of his mother's children and his father loves him. And you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him, right? That I, that I may set or place my eyes upon him. And we said to my master, no, we cannot. The boy, or we cannot bring the boy and leave at his father for if he should leave him, right? To forsake or loose, right? Him at his father, then he would die. But you said to your servants, if not come down your brother, the youngest, with you, no more shall you see my face. So no to add, to increase, and that's the root for Yahusuf's name as well, by the way. But no more he will add unto seeing my face. So it was when he went up to your servant, my father, that we told, right, that's that Nagid, that we told unto him at the, the words of my master, and said, Our father, go back and buy grain unto us a little, or, you know, buy grain to us a little food. But we said, No, we cannot go, un we cannot go down if, or, right, if in substance. Our brother, the youngest, is with us. Then we will go down. For not we may see the face of the man, but our brother, right? Unless our brother, the youngest, is with us. And this is, they say, except, but that's I knew, not him with us, is literally how it says. If you were taking it in the literal, just literal word for word, it would sound very butchered. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to show you guys earlier when we go over the Hebrew. It's not always easy to make an, an English translation without having it of necessity changed. A great deal of the problem is that we speak backwards from Hebrew nowadays in English as opposed to the Hebrew. So our verbs and our, our nouns and things are different than how it was back then. It's a modern Hebrew phenomenon that's actually switched and conforms more with the English, but the biblical is backwards to us, which makes it difficult. Otherwise, it's it's usually very straightforward. You can do word for word, 
The only problem with that, if you have noticed, is that one word is usually not enough to always encapsulate the fullness of what something means. But here we go. It says, and said, or and he said, your servant, my father, to us, you know, right? Ethem yadetem. It says, you know them that these two sons were born to me of my wife and went out the one from me. And I said, surely, ach, to pieces he is torn and not I have seen him since, behold, right? Since the time. It says, Hani. Um, while he hasn't seen him, and that's what's directly mentioned, you will find as we go through the testaments of the 12 patriarchs that there were visions, the idea that he's seen Yahusuf alive. It was in a vision that Benjamin had that he actually witnesses that he talks about. And there's things that he mentions where in Naphtali's vision as well, Yahusuf is seen alive. And he mentions these things that, ah, so it may be that he was living, but he had not seen him and he had said those things and he had thought it for over a year. <clears throat> it says, but if you take also eth this one from me or from my, my face or from my presence and it befalls him harm, then you shall bring down eth my gray hair in sorrow to the grave. And therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, since his soul, and his soul is bound up with the lad's, or in his soul, it says with the lad's life, but that's not the word life. It's the word nefesh. And that word means a soul, a living being. They translated his life because they used that in the uh, places where it says the life is in the blood, but it's the soul. It's the, it's the living being of the person that is literally within the blood, just as oxygen permeates throughout the body, as the breath, spirit, ruach, is breath, wind, spirit. It's all the same word. And as your literal breath, what we call oxygen, travels all throughout your body through your blood, your soul, the nefesh, does as well. It's the, but it's they're not the same. So it's important. These distinctions are given in his word, and it's having a right concept of them helps us to comprehend how things truly are. I pray that makes sense. But as we go over it more, you'll you'll see. They translate this as life because they say the life is in the blood. But it's your nefesh. Your nefesh, your soul, is in the blood. And another lady, um, the Healing Wings Ministry, uh, it's a great thing I highly recommend looking into for people, along with Barbara O'Neill's stuff for the Ministry of Healing and for things about uh, proving that his word is true and that sin in our life causes health issues and a variety of other problems so it really confirms that but they have some wrong concepts they say that the the soul and the mind are synonymous when they're not the soul is in the blood and the mind is the conductor of it is what the scriptures actually teach and having a right concept helps us to uh, to know how everything really is it's not some people might think that's being nitpicky, but we should be careful to examine these things meticulously in every aspect, not just to nitpick anyone else, but even the things that we believe. We shouldn't be presumptuous, but to prove it with that same kind of zeal, because no falsehood is of the truth, right? He, he is the truth, and that is the way and the life. So we can believe him or not, but I, I tend to believe him and literally just like a child, take what he said. Yes, ma'am, prove all things. It says, do not despise foretellings. And if you haven't realized yet, the foretelling is speaking his word, the announcement of the good news, if you will, the basora. It is the truth 
in Yahushua or the scriptures that's declared that is foretelling. When it says in Yahukana or Revelation that you had to swallow the little book and foretell to many other peoples and places and things, that was about the revivals of the word and the preaching of the good news. Those two are synonymous, foretelling and preaching in that capacity there, just so you know. They are the same thing. So anyone who's talking about our creator will return, there's going to be a future judgment. There's going to be a, a time of unspeakable tov things that the mind of a mind cannot comprehend. Whenever you say these things, you're foretelling. You're literally speaking the future. So that is true, and it will be, just to keep that in mind. But here we go. Let's finish what we got going on real quick. And it says, <clears throat> um, for your servant guaranteed, there's that Arab, right? Right. For your servant guaranteed, eth ha, the youth to his father, saying, if not, I bring him back to you, then I then I shall bear the sin before my father all the days. And at this time, it says now, therefore, but literally at this time, let remain now your servant instead or in place of the youth as a slave to my master. And the youth, he will go, or he will go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the boy is I knew not with me? Right? Least, pen, least I see the evil which I he will come or he will bring at my father. Now, this is where he made the choice to do the thing that he said he would. He's acting as what we call the kinsman redeemer and is rewarded accordingly. But thank you all for your time for this one. I'm pretty sure that's going to wrap us up for this Shabbat. So you all have a wonderful Shabbat, a Shavua Tov, and we will see you next week where Yahusuf reveals his identity. Hallelujah, and uh, we'll see you then.